share with you today. It's Human, Human Relations Day today, and if you'd like to support humanitarian work of the United Methodist Church, there is an envelope in your worship book to make a contribution. And for those at home, I'm sure uh, we can let you know how you could also support as well. <laughs> and 2021 has arrived, and it's a great way to grow in our faith is to be in the Word. And having an accountability group helps us stay there. If you're looking for a group like that, one focusing on the Gospel of Luke is being offered. And this group will consist of scripture copying, meditation, memorization, and a weekly Zoom discussion on Monday evenings at 7, beginning tomorrow, January 18th. It will also be possible to do the devotion on your own if you'd prefer. So if you'd email Kristen if you're interested. And that's Kristen with an E, not an I. Uh, and the Community Emergency Shelter Project is coming. It's coming soon. So please check the worship booklet to see where you can be a part of Asbury's effort to help with this critical ministry to the marginalized of Salisbury. The care service is looking for your help. You! Yes, you! <laughs> After many years, Kim and Shelly are stepping down from running the worship slides, and we need some folks to help try to replace them. We also need someone to coordinate prayers and concerns, help with sound, and we need help with our crucial video for the service. Training will be available, so don't think you have to jump in and know everything. And if you are interested, Pastor Tom would love to talk to you. Oh, the next one is my announcement. Super Bowl Sunday is coming up soon, uh, February 7th, and we usually participate in the Super Bowl of caring. Soup like you eat. So clever. And uh, we have... Uh, Salisbury Urban Ministries has decided to only accept monetary donations. So to make that a little bit of fun, we are setting up a superstore. Uh, this is just phase one. This isn't complete. So come back for phase two. But uh, we'll have items that you can buy and donate and um, uh, so we can make the big impact that, that Salisbury Urban Ministries is used to having us make. And... They just told, they told me um, this week that without our help and Christ's help, they just don't know how they would get through the year. So our help is so crucial for them, and they, they know that and appreciate that. <clears throat> we have a mystery as ASP fundraiser coming next week. I was told to just stay tuned. That's all I know about it. <laughs> Uh, and then be sure to check out all the announcements in your worship booklet or uh, and found on our website at asburyweb.org along with next steps on page 9 to prayerfully discern how God is calling you to put your faith into action based on today's worship experience. And like last week, we are going to safely uh, do pass our peace with a wave or an elbow. Just say hello to someone you haven't seen for a while. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. We have now reached the part where we're going to open our worship with music. I'm a 
trying. Just go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes. to email Lydia to let her know that we changed the second song. <laughs> Yo 
heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and i will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken. Good morning. It was on. I didn't have to find the right button. Uh, the, our scriptures this morning, the first lesson is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 20 through the interna New International Version. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he s calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the tears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from the beginning to end. For I told him I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed the God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli the guilt of Eli's family will never be atoned for by, for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, 
But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And then Sam Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our next lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20, God's words translation version. Someone may say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is helpful. I'm allowed to do anything, but I won't allow anything to gain control over my life. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will put an end to both of them. However, the body is not for sexual sin, but the Lord and the Lord is for the body. God brought the Lord back to life, and by his power, God will also bring us back to life. Don't you realize that your bodies are parts of Christ's body? Should I take the parts of Christ's body and make them parts of a prostitute's body? That's unthinkable. Don't you realize that the person who unites himself with a prostitute becomes one body with her? God says the two will be one. However, the person who unites himself with the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Stay away from sexual sins, other sins that people commit don't affect their bodies the same way as sexual sins do. People who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Don't you know that your body is a temple that belongs to the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, whom you received from God, lives in you. You don't belong to yourselves. You were brought, bought for a price, so bring glory to God in the way you use your body. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good to see everybody today and friends at home. So I have a question for everybody today. Give me a thumbs up if you have a best friend. Anybody have a best friend? Or if you could, more than one best friend. Good, yeah, I have a best friend. I met her in college. Oh, I don't know now, 25, 26 years ago, or maybe more. I don't know, but anyway, the instant I met her, she was my best friend. I really, I'd say I don't even remember a time that she wasn't my best friend because that's how much I connected with her immediately. And it's, it's really cool when that happens, when you meet somebody and you just know, this is somebody I want to spend time with. Has that happened? Yeah. So I have to imagine that is how it was when Jesus met his friends, the disciples. And scripture tells us, scripture that we'll hear um, here shortly, that um, Jesus was traveling to his hometown and he ran into this guy named Philip. And right away, he just suddenly says to Philip, hey, come with me. <laughs> he doesn't even know this guy. And Philip says, you know, Philip says, okay. And not only does Philip say, okay, but he goes and he tells some more friends, hey, come with me and follow this guy, Jesus. And they say, okay. <laughs> It's just kind of crazy to think about that, but, you know, Jesus knew when he, he knew when he looked at these people, they were his people. They were, they were meant to come with him. He could trust them. He knew when he looked at them that they would listen as he taught them all about God, and then that they would go and they would share God with everyone that they met. He knew that right away. And, you know, how did he know that? Because Jesus doesn't look at the outside of people. And I think we do this too. We look at people on the outside and we make all kinds of assumptions about, you know, who they are or what they do or what they love or all that stuff. But that's not where Jesus looks. He's not looking at you on the outside. If you're a mess, he doesn't see that. He's looking in at your heart, just like his father God does, looks at your heart. So think about that sometimes because we're really hard on ourselves. What do you think God sees when he looks at our heart? You think he sees the mess? He, mm. I think he sees that you all are beautiful, every single one of you, 
and he sees that you have so much goodness inside of you and there's so many great things that you can do and he sees that we love each other and he loves us that's what God sees when he looks in our heart let's say a prayer together thank you God for ignoring the mess on the outside for looking on the inside and seeing our beauty help us to see each other that same way and help us always to say yes when we ask, when you ask us to be your friend. Help us to invite others to be your friend too. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning. Does this work if I leave this on? Because I'll be moving this around so I don't want to breathe out. Um, this is the time of the service where we share our prayers and concerns. Uh, so today we'd like prayers for the family of Phyllis Taylor and also for Howard and Connie Bosman who are in the hospital with, uh, with COVID. Um, and that said, I will walk around a bit with this if anybody has anything they want to share. If I don't break it. Anybody? Uh, Ken and I have a friend and neighbor who I've mentioned here before who got early onset dementia several years ago. She's younger than me. I think she's in her mid-50s. And she passed away this week. And it was just, her husband is just wrecked. And it just, I just am so very sad for him. But her name is Michelle Artis, and her husband is Ron. And please keep them in your prayers. She was a nurse at Parkside High School for a number of years. Yeah, she's a school nurse. nurse. Just a lovely, lovely person. Yeah. It's devastating. My um, ex-husband's uncle had a stroke this week with a brain bleed, but he has a living will in DNR, so he's at home with hospice to just wait, wait it out. Anybody else? Yeah, Brooke mentioned it earlier, but we have uh, 17 slots we need to fill for the overnight shift at CESP. I've got a calendar out of my car if anybody's interested. See me after church. See me after church. Um. It was finally announced Kim and I are going to be giving up the slides um, after we, we don't even know how many years, maybe 15, I don't know, a lot. And it's been a great ministry, but, you know, it's time to share that ministry with somebody else. And the care service needs lots of help, lots of hands uh, make light work. And it's not that we're all jumping ship. We're, we want to be here, we want to worship here, but we would like some help. So if, during that announcement when Brooke was saying, you know, all the things that we need, if, if you felt a little, a little tug at your heart, maybe pray about that and see if there's some way that you can help this service to, to grow and, and be what it always has been, the, the wonderful sharing place to learn and fellowship with one another. So um, keep, keep that in your prayers. Well said. I just want to ask prayers of peace uh, in this coming week. Uh, that God just blesses all of us uh, with calm uh, and that peace may rule in, in all of our hearts uh, during this time. Anyone else? All set, everybody. So when Tom asked me to do this, um, I've been channeling a, a couple of pieces of scripture and um, Roger McGuinn, anybody know who that is? The birds? Um, so before I pray, I just want to share something. Uh, there's a season for everything and a time for every matter under the heavens, a time for giving birth and a time for dying, a time for planting and a time for uprooting what was planted, you know how it goes. And so as we struggle through a lot of uncertainty and, um, you know, clearly change in seasons that we didn't anticipate, it just, you know, 
encourage you, and I'll do this through prayer, that we remember that um, this too is a season that God has planned and God has control over. And we'll come out of this on the other side if we just hang together. So let's say a quick prayer. Hey, God, um, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share fellowship with people who are simply trying to follow a path that you're pointing to. Uh, help us to uh, reflect you in such a way that people are drawn to that path and that we can uh, share the love that we have for you and more importantly that you have for us with them. Uh, and help us to pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, We are truly a blessed people. To be able to gather, to worship, to be able to come into the presence of the Lord and one another here in this place, whether that be physically or virtually, God is here and with us. And so let us give now to continue the work that God is doing in this place so that others may know Christ and the gift of salvation. Come as the Spirit leads. And before, as you come, before you come, let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks. Thank you for this bright and wonderful day. Thank you for being with us. And we ask your blessing upon all who are here, all who are online with us, all who come into your presence. The gifts that we give, may you magnify and multiply them to continue your work in this place. All this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come, friends.
because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long and I believe you are the way the truth the light I believe you are the way the truth the light I believe you are. Our gospel this morning is from John first chapter verse 43 to 51 from the easy to read version the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee he met Philip and said to him follow me Philip was from the town of Bethsaida the same as Andrew Peter and Peter Andrew and Peter Philip found Nathanael and told him we have found the man that Moses wrote about in the law the prophets wrote about him too he is Jesus, the son of Joseph. He is from Nazareth. But Nathanael said to Philip, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip answered, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, This man coming is a true Israelite, one you can trust. Nathanael asked, How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip told you about me. Then Nathanael said, Teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said to him, Do you believe this just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You will see much greater things than that. Then he said, Believe me when I say that you will all see heaven again. You will see angels of God going up and coming down on the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us take a moment to be in prayer together. Most gracious and holy God, the day is new and the air is clear and the sun is bright. Feels as if the day were created just for our benefit and blessing. We celebrate the day and worship you this morning. We come bringing with us the joys and disappointments of the past week. But here in this place, we are called to release the hurts and pains to you, to embrace the joys and love that we feel, and to seek your face as we praise and worship you. Bless us in this time as we open your scriptures to learn and understand. Use our experience and reason and traditions to illuminate your word and your works in our midst. O oh, blessed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Move here and now to make my words clear and your truth clearer. Bless us with the presence of your Son, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So I don't know about you, but for me, 2020 was a pretty difficult year. Uh, and as a result of the pandemic and all that came with it, right, I got to spend way more time at home than I normally do, which... Um, meant I spent more time with the kids than they probably wanted to spend with me, and I spent more time with them probably than I wanted to, but we got along. It all worked out. Part of, of that time that we spent together was working on homework. Um, I spent, I think, more time working on homework this year than I have in, in several years. Sarah normally does the bulk of that because she tends to be around more than I am. But I got to spend time both with Bethany and with Sammy, who were studying the play Macbeth. 
Um, it is easily remembered as one of the Bard's shortest and bloodiest tragedies, written during a time of significant political and unrest and uncertainty in England. Macbeth reflects this sense of chaos in its themes, tempo, and tone. Now, for those of you who have never heard the story, or if you're like me, have chosen to forget it from when you studied it in high school, let me give you a brief rundown. And yes, friends, there absolutely will be spoilers, just so you know. As the story opens, the three witches come on stage and they prophesy to Macbeth that he is going to be king of all Scotland. Now he puzzles about this because Duncan is currently on the throne. But he also doesn't want to wait to see how that is going to happen. And so he takes uh, the process into his own hands and slays Duncan and claims the throne. Macbeth, who until this time had been considered one of Duncan's most loyal generals and, and best lords, becomes a mad tyrant, unable to let go of his ambition and unable to deal with the consequences of his own violence to further his ambition. As the murders continue to add up in number, Macbeth returns to the three witches to see what will become of him and his crown. And the witches, through various visions, warn him of a couple of things. Number one, beware Macduff. Number two, they then reassure him that the crown is safe until Burnham Wood shall come to Dunsinane Hill, where Macbeth's castle resides. And finally, they calm his fears by telling him that none born of woman can harm him. Macbeth assumes that he has succeeded and that the crown is his for years to come. This spurs his ambition to even greater heights of wickedness and violence. Ultimately, as you can guess, Macbeth gets what he deserves and he realizes the error of his assumptions too late. Macduff, who had been hiding in England, does return to fight Macbeth on behalf of Malcolm, who is Duncan's son. On his way, he tells his soldiers to cut down branches from Burnham Wood and carry them with them to disguise their numbers, thus bringing the forest to Dunsinane Hill. And then finally, Macduff, who in the end kills Macbeth, tells the villain as he dies that he was taken from his mother's womb by the sword after she had died in childbirth, therefore fulfilling the prophecies that the witches has revealed. It's these assumptions that we make, that Macbeth made, right? These assumptions that we make are really a normal part of life. They can help streamline our thought process significantly or they can lead us down trails that we never should have gone down as in the case of Macbeth. When used appropriately, assumptions are incredibly useful, right? We need to make assumptions about how things work and how the world um, happens, what things happen in the world in order to function effectively in daily life. And let me give you some examples. So we assume when we go to bed at night that the sun is gonna rise in the morning. We don't know that to be a fact, but we assume it. And since for billions of years that has happened day after day after day, it's a pretty good assumption. It allows us to think about the future and plan ahead so that when we get to that day, we know what we are going to do. When we leave home, we assume other drivers on the road are gonna follow the rules of the road. We assume that they are gonna do what they're supposed to do so that all of us can arrive to our at our destination safely and in one piece. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue if there were no rules of the road? We assume when we board a flight that it will pull up to the gate at our destination city at about a time that we think it should. This is an excellent assumption in terms of airline safety, which is amazing. It is not such a good assumption when it comes to being there on time. We all know that feeling. But we, as humans, in, in addition to making good assumptions, we also make bad assumptions, don't we? That have resulted at ch for, in challenges at times and, and sometimes in pain and heartache. Assumptions can lead us to misunderstandings that have consequences, don't they? 
And these consequences can lead in turn to laughs or tears depending on the situation. And if you don't believe me, just watch any episode of the Brady Bunch or Gilligan's Island and you will see what I mean. For example, we think when we are born and come into the world that the world and everything in it revolves around us. As infants and children, we are the center of the universe and the people and things in our lives revolve around our wants and needs. It's in maturing and growing and going through the process of living that we come to understand that other people matter too and that we are not the center necessarily of our own lives. We invite God to be part of that. We invite each other to be part of that. And truly, if we're going to love deeply, then we have to recognize that the same humanity that lives and dwells within us dwells in each and every other person. The image of God that we are blessed with resides in each and every one of you. Think about Adam and Eve and the assumptions that they made in the garden, right? They assumed that they could eat and God wouldn't mind, even though God had expressly told them not to. And because of, um, because of their pride and defiance, really because of their sin, God exiles them from the garden and leaves them out in the cold, hard world. Even though we are invited into the presence of God, it is a bad assumption to think that we are God. Finally, we assume that because we feel a certain way about someone, whomever that may be, that that person will replicate those feelings for us. That is never a good assumption. The only thing, the only way that we can truly know what someone else thinks or feels is by asking them and inviting some conversation on that topic. When we assume that we know how someone feels or thinks, we are taking their power away and confiding it within us because we don't ask them to be part of the conversation that we just assume we know what they are gonna say. In the gospel lesson for today, Jesus is wandering the countryside and he meets up with Philip, right? And he invites Philip to come and to follow him. And Philip readily agrees, excited about the opportunity to become a disciple. <clears throat> but instead of dropping everything and going to follow Jesus, what does Philip do? Just like Andrew went and got Peter and brought Peter to Jesus earlier in this first chapter of the Gospel of John, Philip goes to Nathanael and says to him, we have found the man that Moses wrote about in the law, the prophets wrote about him too. He is Jesus, son of Joseph. He is from Nazareth. And Nathanael answers, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip replies simply, come and see. In this opening to the gospel reading, Nathanael is making a significant assumption, isn't he? Either Jesus is not much of a Messiah because he comes from Nazareth, or Nazareth is incapable of producing the Messiah. Because Nathanael thinks he knows Nazareth, he assumes he knows Jesus as well. Clearly an awful assumption. The real question for Nathanael at this point is does he trust his friend Philip enough to listen to his invitation to come and see? Or does he think he knows enough about Nazareth to know enough about Jesus to then make the decision to say, I'll pass, thank you very much. That's a challenge for us too, isn't it? Whenever there is a decision that we have to make, whenever an invitation is laid at our feet, do we know enough about this decision based on our own assumptions to make it or do we need more information? Do we need to ask some help? Do we need to pray? Do we need to listen a little bit more? Truth be told, whenever we look into the future, there are always a set of assumptions attached, aren't there? We can never know the answers to the questions because those answers haven't happened yet. We can only guess about what we think is going to happen in the future and then see if what we surmise will come to pass. Like, for example, 
we oftentimes invest a considerable amount of time creating a church budget, right? It's a part of the way that, that Asbury functions. To keep order, to maintain ministry, we put together a budget. I guarantee you that each and every budget that we create is based on a, a significant number of assumptions because we don't know what's going to happen in the next year. Because of the pandemic, we have no idea based on previous assumptions what's going to happen in this year. The pandemic has shattered all of those thoughts that we had about what this next year is going to look like, and we have no idea. We have to go back and think through our beliefs, go beyond those beliefs to put together something that we think will work for us in the coming year. We need to go back and retool our assumptions, rethink about what we know, and we have to go beyond our beliefs to truly understand what is going to happen in the next year. In the gospel, Nathaniel trusts Philip and is willing to suspend his assumptions to accept, accept the invitation to come and see Jesus. And Jesus is able to help Nathaniel see clearly that he is indeed the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God. Jesus does this. Tells Nathaniel that he is a man you can trust, that Jesus saw him under the fig tree and knows him, and Nathanael is amazed and responds that Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Kings. Wow. That's going quite a ways beyond his original assumptions, isn't it? Beyond his religion, original beliefs about who Jesus is. Friends, any faith that we have is rooted in assumptions too. What we believe comes down to us from somewhere, doesn't it? And clearly, we have a lot of guideposts along the way, right? Scripture, tradition, experience, reason that help us understand. But some of the things that we believe, that we have faith in, are assumptions on our part. How do those form and where do they come from? Think about this for a moment. We can all agree that salvation happens, right? Scripture promises it to us. Um, many of us have experienced the gift of salvation. If you look back on the arc of your life, you can say you said yes to a relationship with Jesus. Most of us can say that. Or we can point to a point in time that we say we gave our life to Christ and we entered into that relationship holy. We picked up that gift of salvation and unwrapped it and opened it before us. So we know that salvation is a real thing. We know that it is a gift from God. But a question as we think about salvation, does it last for all time? In other words, let me ask this, once saved, always saved? Or can we, as Wesley would say, backslide out of our salvation? However you choose to answer that question is really an assumption on our part. Scripture doesn't speak to it directly. Tradition, experience, and reason hint towards an answer, but it is not clear. It requires us to dig in and interpret this idea in conjunction with a number of other things that we believe or that have been, come, that have been handed to us through Scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. So what do you believe and why do you believe it? Are you open to other possibilities? This is the journey of life that we are all on, isn't it? To look at our belief, because sometimes things come into our lives, like pandemics, that disrupt everything in them, and then we're forced to reorder what we believe and put everything back together to go beyond belief, to create a new understanding of God and God at work in the world. There are so many places in our journey of faith where we think oftentimes we've got it all figured out, don't we? And friends, God is inviting us into something bigger and deeper and much more profound than anything that we can imagine, right? That's what Jesus says to Philip and Nathaniel. Look at the things that you will see. And my friends, if you put your faith and trust in Christ and keep your eyes open, look and see what will happen. What would have happened to Nathaniel if he had said no to Philip's invitation? 
If he had listened to the assumptions that were rolling around in his brain, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? He had just said, no, thanks, but no thanks, Philip. Would we know his name? Would he have ever had a chance to live into that experience that he did with Christ? To go on a journey of a lifetime that changed him and changed the world? So where are the opportunities for you to explore what you believe and why you believe it? All of us make assumptions, don't we? Where do these assumptions help us and where do they hold us back? And how can we tell the difference? Friends, this is where the gift of spiritual practice comes into sight and makes all the difference. This is where contemplation and study of scripture and prayer and spiritual conversation and accountability all come clearly into focus and help us see what is an assumption, what is a deeply rooted understanding, and how we put those together to help us understand the world and God's work in it, right? Contemplation, reflecting on what's happening in the world, then going to the scriptures, praying about what we see, asking for insight. And then some of us have the gift of being able to discern what God is saying internally. Some of us, like me, need to talk that out. So I go and I pray and reflect, and it's in conversation with other people that I help to discern what God is saying to me. Each of us has our own strengths and gifts, has our own way to connect with God, but it is in doing that over and over and over again through daily, weekly, monthly practice that we understand what we believe and why we believe it, that we connect with God and one another in a deeper way, and through these connections, test and revisit what we believe and gain new insight and new understanding. We are always invited to go deep in order to go beyond our own beliefs and build a foundation, just like the praise team sang about, a foundation on which our faith can flourish and grow, a foundation that will yield an abundance of faith that will stand up to any storm that is secured and rooted on, built upon the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. It's a brand new year, friends. What better time to think about embracing this idea of practice, of questioning and answering, of seeking and discerning as we reflect, connect, and dig deeper into our journey together. So where will you go in 2021? As Philip invites, come and see. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand in preparation for our sending forth. Jesus is here, the light of the world, the king of the universe, the savior of us all. Let us go and take Christ to the world. Amen. Oh
Peace, everyone.